This mother fired eight shots at the murderer of her daughter in court, avenging her child, but also plunged herself into a whirlpool of consequences. Some see her act as justifiable revenge for her daughter, while other people see it as blatant defiance of the law, warranting severe punishments. The trial garnered attention not only in Germany, but worldwide. Even over 40 years later, the case remains one of the most notable in Germany. Why did this mother take matters into her own hands before the trial concluded? What injustices led her to openly challenge the law? What exactly happened all those years ago? Let's rewind to 1985 and revisit the details of this case. Lübeck, located in northern Germany, is a city rich in history, renowned for its picturesque landscape and abundant medieval landmarks. Marianne Bachmeier was born in June 1950 in Lower Saxony, Germany, two parents who survived the ravages of World War II, with her father serving the Nazi armed SS. His traumatic military experiences led to alcoholism and violent outbursts, making home life unbearable. Marianne grew up in this environment, becoming spirited and independent stark contrast to her parents' conservative values. Constant conflicts arose, eventually culminating in her father abandoning the family, leaving Marianne and her mother to face turbulent times alone. Unfortunately, peace was short-lived as Marianne's mother remarried, introducing a stepfather whose cruelty surpassed that of her biological father. Blaming Marianne's rebelliousness for family discord, her mother sided against her, leaving Marianne unloved and unsupported. Growing up in such adversity, Marianne became a troubled youth. At 16, she experienced her first pregnancy. Unable to care for her own child, as a student, she gave her daughter up for adoption. Two years later, at 18, she found herself pregnant again, this time intending to raise the child with her boyfriend. However, before birth, a traumatic incident involving her mother led to the end of her relationship. Feeling ill-equipped to raise another child alone, Marianne chose adoption once more. After graduating high school, she found work as a waitress at a bar in Lubeck where she later became involved with the bar manager. In 1972, at the age of 22, Mary Ann became pregnant for the third time. Despite her modest means and unmarried status, she felt a deep sense of guilt for the previous daughter that she had given away. She was determined to raise this child herself, regardless of circumstances. On November 14, 1972, Marianne's third daughter was born, and she named her Anna Bachmeier. Mary Ann underwent sterilization surgery to make sure that Anna was her last child. She expressed that she didn't want any other children beside Anna. In the days that followed, Marianne revolved around Anna, caring for her diligently. However, as time passed, Marianne encountered difficulties as a single mother. Devoting all her time to caring for Anna left her with no opportunity to work and earn money. Facing financial difficulties, Marianne has no choice but to bring Anna with her to work at the bar. Consequently, Anna spent her days in the noisy environment of the bar. Fortunately, she was obedient and well-behaved, and the bar staff treated her kindly. Over time, people in the neighborhood became acquainted with the lovely Anna, and colleagues, neighbors alike took care of her. However, this arrangement was not sustainable. The bar operated at night, and Anna spent all her time there, leading to an unhealthy lifestyle and greater chance of meeting people with bad intentions. Marianne, as a mother, naturally worried about the situation but felt trapped. She was already a part owner of the bar and couldn't abandon it. She needed to earn money to provide a good life for her daughter, thus unable to fully devote herself to Anna's care. Feeling helpless, Marianne contemplated finding a reliable person to care for Anna, However, she couldn't bear the fact that she has to give her away. As time passed, it was already 1980, and Anna, now 7 years old, lived a somewhat normal life, attending school like other children. On May 4th, a minor disagreement occurred between Anna and Marianne over trivial matters. Being a child, Anna acted stubbornly and decided not to attend school the next day, opting to play with her friends instead. However, finding none of her classmates available, she wandered the streets alone. When Marianna woke up the next day, assuming Anna had gone to school, she didn't think much of it. But as the school day ended and Anna didn't return home, Marianne grew worried and began searching for her. Unable to find any trace of Anna, Marianne panicked and reported to the police. Despite extensive searches by the police, Anna still remained missing. Just when they were at a loss, a woman voluntarily told the police that her fiancé had killed Anna. She explained that her fiancé had lured Anna to their home on her pretext of playing with her cat, but never let her leave. She stated that her fiancé confessed to her that she had strangled Anna with a pair of stockings. Afterward, he placed her body in a little cardboard box and buried that box at a nearby river. Upon hearing this, the police promptly followed the woman to find him. When the police arrived at the location, they discovered the house was already empty. However, there was a note left behind, a message from the suspect to the woman who had reported the incident. The note read, Dearest, I'm waiting for you at a nearby bar. Let's have a good chat. Please come. As it turned out, the suspect hadn't fled. Several officers rushed to the bar and brought the man back to the police station for questioning. Simultaneously, near the river bank, they found the little Anna. She was bound with a rope and stuffed in a box. 
It seemed that everything the reporting woman had said was true. After a preliminary investigation, the man was identified to be Klaus Grabowski, who lived next door to Mariana. There had been no previous animosity between them, yet Klaus had ruthlessly targeted an innocent child. Klaus is a peculiar 35-year-old butcher and had a dark history. He was a sexual offender who had committed several crimes against young girls. As far back as 1973, when he was 28, Klaus assaulted a six-year-old girl. Fortunately, the little girl's loud scream alerted nearby people, leading to Klaus's fleeing the scene. During that incident, Klaus was charged with attempted murder but received probation. Consequently, he hadn't served time in prison. One would expect that he learn from that experience and reform. But shockingly, after two seemingly honest years, he committed another crime and was caught red-handed. This time, he was accused of sexually abusing two young girls. It appeared that Klaus was finally cornered. However, he claimed that the accident happened when he was having episodes of mental illness. As a result, he was sent to a psychiatric hospital for treatment, instead of jail. After undergoing therapy, Klaus showed some improvement, but he remained a danger to society. Releasing him without caution could lead to further incident, yet keeping him locked up indefinitely wasn't a viable solution. So, after much consideration, a chemical castration was proposed. Chemical castration at the time involved injecting female hormones to reduce male testosterone levels, thereby diminishing sexual desires and impulsivity. In Germany at the time, people believed that chemical castration is the way to go for a repeat offender like him. The court presented Klaus with two options, accept chemical castration and regain his freedom or continue staying in the psychiatric hospital. Klaus eagerly accepted the offer, preferring freedom. Thus, he avoided imprisonment once again. Initially, Klaus seemed to lose his sexual impulses and lived quietly for two years. However, his true nature remained unchanged. Unable to bear loneliness, he consulted a urologist who informed him that chemical castration was reversible. Klaus then returned to court, claiming he had reformed and even formed a relationship intending to start a family. Despite minimal investigation, the court surprisingly granted Klaus's request. Subsequently, Klaus visited the urologist, concealed his criminal record, and claimed that he was only punished this way due to public nudity. He was now a free man, but the side effects of chemical castration lingered, prompting him to seek hormone therapy for a reversal. And so, Klaus regained his freedom, but the consequences of his action continued to haunt him. The doctor also found it unreasonable that such a young man was castrated, so they decided to help him. After multiple treatments, on April 25th, Klaus fully recovered his hormone levels and returned to the state before castration. This meant the dangerous Klaus was back, and just 10 days later, he extended his claws towards Anna. On May 5th, Anna couldn't find her classmates and ended up playing alone on the street. Klaus witnessed the scene and lured Anna to his home. There, he tortured Anna for hours and ultimately murdered her. For Mariana, who lost her daughter, accepting this reality was impossible. She didn't even have the courage to look at her dead daughter's body. She was consumed by deep self-blame, her last remaining daughter. She had vowed to take good care of her, but tragedy struck. Mariana locked herself in her room, regretting the arguments she had with her daughter, her job at the bar, and not personally taking Anna to school, but all the regrets were futile. In her newfound calmness, Marianne realized that the only thing she could do for her daughter now was to make sure the perpetrator gets the appropriate punishment. After waiting in agony for 10 months, the trial against Klaus finally began. When questioned by the police, Klaus claimed that he hadn't intended to harm Anna. He said Anna had blackmailed him, threatening to accuse him of inappropriate behavior if he hadn't complied. In a heated argument, he accidentally strangled Anna. The police did not believe Klaus. After all, he's a repeat offender. Could a child really blackmail a repeat offender like him? The trial took place in March 1981 at the Lubeck District Court. Klaus didn't deny that Anna died at his hands. He even described the entire process. His responses seem experienced and indeed he was well versed. Remember Klaus's two previous cases? Despite evidence linking him to the crimes, his mental health allowed him to escape severe punishment. Now people worry, while well, history repeats itself. While well, he escaped the legal consequences once again. Klaus's defense attorney claimed that his actions are due to hormonal imbalances caused by the voluntary castration years ago. And due to this being a side effect of the surgery, his action should be deemed involuntary. The attorney sought to absolve Klaus of guilt. His statement sparked intense debate. Many questioned whether Germany's approach of chemically castrating sex offenders was reasonable. Back then, numerous offenders accepted chemical castration for freedom, yet no institution monitored or managed them afterward. If they secretly consulted private doctors or obtained drugs to reverse the procedure, castration was no more. Based on this, Marianne also sued a doctor who treated Klaus, but they didn't face any punishment. On the second day of the trial, the police revealed the scene where Anna was found. Police then realized Klaus's depravity, a heartbroken frenzy. On the third day of the trial, Marianne arrived at the courthouse early. As Klaus was led to the defendant's seat, she followed him. She wore a coat and walked directly toward the seat. 
When he was just three meters away from Claus, Marianne swiftly pulled out a handgun and fired eight shots without hesitation. It all happened too quickly and too suddenly. After firing the shots, Marianne tossed the gun aside and raised her hand in surrender. She said, I originally wanted to shoot him in the face, but unfortunately, I could only shoot him in the back. Suddenly, a figure emerged from somewhere. She had done it. She really had. The person speaking was Anna's father, Marianna's ex-boyfriend, and Klaus, seven out of eight shots hit him. After medical examination, he was pronounced dead on the spot. This shocked everyone in the courtroom, as shooting someone in the courtroom was unprecedented. This incident caused a huge sensation in Germany. Marianne's name appeared on the front pages of major newspaper overnight. She was dubbed the revenge mother. As news spread and opinions fermented, her story reached people worldwide. Many praised Marianne's act of avenging her daughter. Parents with children said, If it were me, I would do the same. She was just a grieving mother and seeking revenge for her beloved daughter wasn't wrong. She had committed no crime. People sent letters of praise to Marianne, and some even donated 100,000 marks. Of course, there were also opposing views. Some viewed Marianne as a cold-blooded killer who opposed the law. Marianne's trial became a focal point of discussion in Germany and around the world. Major media outlets and news programs extensively covered it. Despite overwhelming support for Marianne, there was an undeniable fact. Although Klaus was heinous, he still needed to face the consequences for his actions. His trial wasn't over, and he hadn't been convicted yet. In other words, legally, he was still innocent when he was shot. Even if he were convicted, he should face legal punishments, not end up like this in the defendant's seat. According to his lawyer, if everyone took law into their own hands and used gun to punish criminals, wouldn't the country descend into chaos? Mariana's actions were direct challenge to the law, and the consequences were severe. The court was well aware of this. Although the majority supported Marianne, they couldn't let that door open, otherwise the whole country will lose order. So her sins cannot be pardoned. On March 2, 1983, Marianna's trial began. Given the case's high profile and unique nature, the proceedings were far from simple. The courtroom overflowed with people who came to support Marianna and witnessed the trial. The court had to relocate to a larger hall capable of accommodating 200 people. Most attendees were there to support Marianne, hoping the law would pardon her. Some even sent threatening letters to the court claiming that if Marianne were found guilty, Everyone in that court will be in danger. The police investigated Mariana and discovered that she had purchased the handgun after Anna's murder. She also practiced shooting in the basement of the bar where she worked. After she shot Klaus, her ex-boyfriend said she did it, she really did it. These details seem to indicate premeditated crime on Marianne's part. If that were the case, it was a serious matter. Premeditated murder could result in a life sentence. The prosecution emphasized that Marianne couldn't have fired so quickly and accurately without practice. It was an impressive shooting performance, achievable only through practice. In court, Mary Ann defended herself, claiming that she bought a gun for self-defense, fearing to cross paths with criminals like Klaus. She insisted she hadn't purchased this specifically to kill him and had never practiced shooting. Additionally, since her daughter's death, she had suffered mental distress due to grief. Later, she heard that Klaus would testify on the third day of the trial, spreading lies about Anna blackmailing him for five pennies. This enraged Mary Ann, and she acted impulsively. She experienced a hallucination, feeling like she was killing Klaus in a dream. During her pre-trial detention, Mary Ann attempted self-harm five times. Doctors and psychologists confirmed significant psychological trauma after enduring a grueling 25-day trial. The final judgment arrived. The judge believed that while Marianne had committed a crime, she wouldn't pose a threat to society. Her mental and emotional trauma from her daughter's murder led her to involuntarily shoot under extreme stress. Therefore, the charge of premeditated murder didn't hold. She was convicted of manslaughter and illegal possession of a firearm, receiving a six-year prison sentence, with possibility of parole. The trial outcome sparked intense debate among the German public. Some felt that the punishment was fair, while the others felt it was too harsh. A subsequent survey revealed that 28% of Germans considered the sentence just, 27% believed it was too severe, 25% thought it was too lenient, and 20% had no opinion. Afterward, Marianne sold her story to a German magazine for 250,000 marks, using the money to cover legal fees. In June 1985, after serving three years, she was granted parole and was released early. Post-release, she quickly married a teacher and moved to Nigeria. However, the marriage didn't last long, and they divorced in 1990. Marianne sought tranquility and relocated to Sicily. Diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, she returned to Germany for better treatment. Knowing that her day was limited, she hired a journalist to document her last days. In a talk show in 1995, Mariana admitted that she had deliberately shot Klaus because she heard he would spread rumors about Anna blackmailing him for five pennies on the trial's third day. 
She didn't want her daughter's memory tarnished. To prevent that, she felt compelled to act. This further validated the prosecution's analysis. However, today, it no longer matters. On September 17, 1996, Marianne passed away at the Lubeck Hospital due to worsening pancreatic cancer. She was only 46 years old and was buried alongside her daughter. Anna. Although this case occurred over 40 years ago, it remained one of the most remarkable cases in Germany after 1945 and a representative example in the field of justice. Do you agree with her action?